Why are my controls no work? Good morning all. How are we doing? Today I am showing the amazing things that one can do with just simple two-dimensional graphics. Oh well there we go. I just died. I'll stop that there. <laughs> And also, it's uh, it's it's like it's it's copyright infringement for educational purposes. I was not doing it for any kind of enjoyment at all. I did not derive any any enjoyment out of that whatsoever. <laughs> Today, well, I was just playing for a moment there. Um, one of the classic uh, beat 'em up arcade games, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, obviously, a little bit of a um. Uh, a point of happiness for myself, actually, that uh, that game from 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 the arcade days. It was always a lot of fun. Um, but we're also hopefully, hopefully, by the end of the day today, going to bring you to the point where you can conceivably create something like this yourself. It's not. Uh, it's not. It's definitely not going to be easy. None of these games were easy to make. They all took, you know years to put together and things like that so um it's not like you necessarily have the full capability to do it but we're going to show you a bunch of techniques that we're using which we could use to make something like uh like teenage mutant ninja turtles or like super mario brothers and stuff like that um but the techniques are different from what they did back in those days, because back in those days they didn't have the polygon rendering that we did. But we're going to be mixing and matching in a sense. We're going to be using the techniques that we are going to be using in 3D, um, but we're showing you how they work in 2D. So, let's roll into the lecture. So, last lecture we were um, getting into more detail into the OpenGL pipeline. So, we looked... In the first week, I showed you the the overall idea of what polygon rendering is. So um, the the idea was how do we take the vertices, which are just the the points on a shape, put them together, and turn them into um, something that we can then render on the screen. Someone's complaining; she wants a lap to sit on, so. Here's our regular good morning from chicken. Um, and so we're talking about like, there's some maths behind this and stuff that just transfers things. And then last lecture on Monday, we looked at what is the actual, um, what is the actual sort of coding structures that go into this? So how does OpenGL actually do these things um, in its own pipeline. So what does it do and how does it pass information from one kind of component to the next um, as it as it um, as it takes us from you know raw numerical vertex data <coughs> and transforms that eventually into also raw numerical pixel data that actually is going to appear on our screen. And so we looked at that we looked at how the colors are pixeled in a polygon as well. And we started to look at these things called textures. 
Um, and so we're going to continue on textures today because all I did um, last time was introduce the idea that we can add more vertex attributes to our vertices. And some of these vertex attributes um, will tell us how we're going to pick parts of an image to use as our colors. One of the important things that we looked at when we were coloring a, coloring a polygon was the idea of fragment interpolation. So the fragment shader, which is one of the last things uh, in the pipeline, is actually able to not just color the pixel itself, but it colors the pixel based on what it knows about the shape that it can see in a particular pixel. And it also knows um, all of the vertex information for the vertices in that shape. So it's able to say, based on how close I am to different vertices, I will numerically change what color I am. Um, we, we also saw that it wasn't just numerically changing the color based on the color of the pixels. If the pixels were mapped to a texture, the, um, the fragment could say, I'm halfway between these two vertices. So my texture coordinates are going to be halfway between those vertices and I'm gonna grab a certain part of the texture. So today we're gonna to continue with the textures. Um, as I say today, what are we covering today? We're co covering making games in 2D. Not quite, but close. We're gonna cover a lot of the graphics for it. I'm not actually covering a whole lot of other stuff about making games in 2D, like um, dealing with input, um, managing things like frame rate, or even like the most important things is like designing gameplay <laughs> or making, uh, making art for it. So all of that stuff is actually, you know, I would say that's probably the bulk of what it takes to make games in 2D. But at least I want to give you the capability to um, create 2D graphics and um, we're sort of upgrading ourselves now from just having things appear static on the, on the screen to being able to move things around in the screen. And we're going to do that through this thing called uh, transformation matrices. Uh, so we're going to be uh, reviving some long lost knowledge. Uh, those of you who um, have done linear algebra in the past, but not recently, will be probably wanting to maybe look this stuff up. Um, or remember just enough so that you can rely on things like our um, maths libraries that we're going to use in code to be able to do it. I mean, I do that. It was really funny actually putting these slides together because I had to, I had to nearly remind myself how to do um, vector arithmetic and matrix vector arithmetic and things like that because um, I don't do it manually, obviously. That's the, the point of having computers a lot of the times to get computers to do it for us. But you do need to know the theory of it. Um, Otherwise, you'll forget why certain things happen in certain ways. Um, and then at the end today, I want to um, do probably the first, but not the last time, um, we're going to deconstruct a game. So I'm going to take a 2D game, and based on what I've taught you about textures and, um, and transforms, talk about how we would re-implement this game if we were going to. Um, this might actually give you some ideas for, for interesting things you might want to do in the first assignment as well. Okay, so continuing textures. Let me just check, is chat working at the moment? <laughs> no one said anything for a while, but I just assume that it's probably working, but just everyone's just so wrapped in what I'm saying that they, they haven't said anything in chat. All right. Someone said it's working, testing. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, people are here. All right, so continuing what we were talking about textures. So a quick recap, thanks Hexus1 saying no, it's broken. Um, a quick recap of what we've seen about textures. So this is the use of image files in polygon rendering. It's not always going to be images. Some textures are not actually images, but they're something else, but it's the idea that we can use a buffer that has some data in it. So, uh, for example, the most common is a two-dimensional buffer with color information in it. So that way, what we can do is we can apply colors to an object. So the idea is we can wrap this flat two-dimensional um, image around a three-dimensional object, or even just map a two-dimensional image onto another two-dimensional object in a certain way so that we can see it clearly in a particular way. Um, so we're going to add vertex attributes 
to our verte vertices. Um, these are going to be um, what we call texture coordinates, and the textures are in a particular coordinate space, I think that's going to be in my next slide, um, between 0 and 1. Um, and it's the idea that we can say each vertex in this model will kind of appear somewhere on this 2D map, and it will say that where the texture coordinate says this vertex is, so this one on the tip of the shoulder here will end up on the tip of the shoulder here, please pick up the color from the texture here and apply that color to this part of the polygon. And then there'll be another vert here somewhere, say for the, the, the sort of for the collarbone here, and it'll be in between those two. Can you get the fragment shader can it, to interpolate across the texture and pick up whatever colors are between those two and put them on this object. So between the vertex shader and the fragment shader, the vertex shader is giving us these um, point locations for things, and the fragment shader is doing everything in between those points uh, to be able to say which colors are going to be on the model where. So that's the, the basics of texturing. And so question is, why would we use uh, textures? Um, and so if we can put colors on vertices, why do we need textures at all? So a good example of this would be like, you know, this arm here has all these ridges in it. If we wanted this thing to go back and forth between colors, we would need a whole bunch of vertices here in the arm to basically say, this stuff is black, this stuff is brown, this stuff is black, this stuff is brown. What we'd end up getting there is that we'd had flat surfaces which are otherwise quite simple surfaces, like the geometry of the surface is simple, like a wall or carpet on a floor and stuff, would end up needing a whole lot of vertices just to represent um, uh, like a wallpaper or, or we do it for something like grass or something like that. We need all these different vertices of different colors just to show that this thing appears a different way. And all those extra verts are gonna take a lot of extra time for us to process every time we're gonna render a shape. Um, they're also going to take a whole lot, of mo whole lot more memory to store when all they were doing is just kind of representing color information. So what we will often do instead is we will use a, a texture instead of complicating geometry. So that way we can use simple geometry and allow the texture to say, here are all the, um, all of the special details about, um, uh, about what's going on in this surface and this visual information will still come through to us um, but at the same time uh, we we don't need this thing to to get complicated in terms of the number of uh, verts that are in it also the less verts that we put in something the less triangles that are in something the less work the shaders need to do to process these things because you know like as we've seen the vertex shader is going to um, do a certain amount of work per vertex in the scene. So the less vertice vertices we have in the scene, the less work the vert shader has to do. This equates to, in the end, um, how much frame rate we're going to get. So frame rate is how many times per second we can change the entire image on the screen. And generally for human acceptance of um, the illusion of movement, the minimum frame rate we were going to want is in the 20s. But in terms of something really feeling smooth, feeling interactive that we can react to and move around in a scene, we're really looking at a minimum of 60 and very, very comfortable for humans around 100 or higher. You know, so we do want to make sure that everything we're doing is optimized and not um, not taking too long to process these things. Um, not only is this talking about minimizing the amount of work we have in our vertex and fragment shaders, we're also minimizing the amount of memory it takes to store things. It's actually much cheaper in terms of memory storage to store a two-dimensional vector than it is, uh, sorry, a two-dimensional texture than it is to... Um, to overly complicate the number of vertices uh, that are in, um, in, in in a piece of terrain or character or something like that in a scene. Um, someone was saying, can textures include fully transparent pixels? Uh, yes, they can. Um, 
The interesting thing about transparency is that we don't necessarily, and we're, we're jumping ahead here, we are going to talk about this, we don't necessarily have a good idea about our viewpoint and what's in front of other things from our viewpoint, because we're just going to render things based on whether something appears in certain pixels. Um, so transparency actually adds a significant amount of work to our rendering pipeline to make it work. It's one of those kind of um, strange things about polygon rendering. Certain things take a lot of effort. So transparency is one of them. Um, but we're going to talk about that later. So I want to show a little example here about how we can have simple geometry, but we can have incredibly complex information coming across. So this is a, a, a literal screenshot that I took uh, a couple of nights ago from Borderlands 3 by Gearbox Software. Um, and I was looking for a scene that would show how some games take a great amount of artistry um, without needing a lot of geometry. So the big example that I wanted to show here is these two posters. So this is on uh, on a spaceship that has uh, certain shops in it. So these are the... Oh, that's a, that's a bar and this is a shop. Um, but I'm going to hazard a guess. I don't know for certain how many verts there are in each of these two surfaces, but I'm going to hazard a guess that these two are just flat rectangles. So there's, there's, there's literally four verts here and uh, there'll be a line across it and two, two big triangles. Um, but what we did was we just plastered an image onto that, done our texture mapping between those verts and we've got a poster. Um, one of the most interesting things about this game in particular, Borderlands, is it's done in a kind of a graphic novel style. So every single texture in this game is hand-painted in a style that makes it look like it was actually hand-painted. So they're, um, they're trying to invoke a nostalgia to a particular era of comics. So there's a bit of an airbrush feel, there's a bit of a watercolour feel and things, and there's definitely a, an ink feel. The fact that there's hard black lines in each of these things. So a lot of the shading is done with the, the illusion of a pen-drawn line. Um, you can see down here on the the flooring here that there are these scratches and the scratches instead of being modeled as scratches or done as realistic scratches they've been done like someone was drawing these scratches with a pen this flooring here all the way across here i think this part here might be a little bit higher than the rest so there's a, a bit of geometry here but most of this geometry through all of this is just on a flat surface so there's no special geometry for these grills or grates or anything like that. It's all just textures. So it's all just us saying, we got an image of this kind of mechanical looking thing, but we've really, really simplified the surface. This surface is flat. This surface going off this way is flat. Um, the only thing that makes this interesting is that people have gone to great lengths um, to paint interesting surfaces that we use as textures and then slap onto these things. Um, these pipes, a low enough polygon that you can see here. So you see the line there, the line there, the line there. You can actually see how few polygons there are here. So there's a line of verts coming through here and another line of verts. These pipes are not going to be very expensive for our graphics card to deal with. Um, a lot of the detail, like these seams, um, the kind of weathering, um, patterns here and stuff like that it's all just been human painted so i think um borderlands is a very good example of taking sort of 3d geometry and stuff like that but not trying to go overboard with the 3d geometry and instead going overboard with the human created side of things so um you get this sort of amazing look i mean i could also go into how how good the lighting is just in this scene um, and just how the colors all play off each other in really interesting ways. But that's all very much what our artists are going to give us, like in terms of um, composition, color, and stuff like that. You get some really cool stuff out of that. But what they've chosen to do is to 
put how cool a game looks, and this is subjective, right? So this is this is obviously one of my favorite games. So like I'm going to talk about it like I really like it, but. They put how cool something looks back in the hands of the artists, you know. And so us as programmers, yeah, we need to be involved in how cool something is. Um, so we're going to provide the capability for artists to do this. But when it comes down to, like, you know, hand-drawing decisions about the scratches and things, or this poster and the colours between it, we, we leave that to someone who has been studying, you know, colour and shape and, and, and drawing and things like that and practicing that for years. So we think about like how much we practice coding, you know, so you're going to be coding something minimum sort of once a week for several years through your uni degree. You're always going to be coding stuff or, or designing code or doing some kind of engineering stuff. And so we rely on us uh, for those kinds of things, but we rely on artists to be able to just draw something like this because they also have that kind of practice. So we lean into who's who's capable of doing what. Um, the gun's also really cool because, again, you see this kind of, um, these black lines, they're not rendered, they're not something that um, we've done via our technology. They're information that we've picked up from the texture. So someone has painted these black lines to look like this thing was drawn in a comic book with black lines along its corners and stuff like that in order to... Um, in order to outline it and shade it. So like you can kind of see the artistry here where there's not that much polygon data in these sections, but there's the illusion of shadows and things like that via the black lines and things. So we can actually do a lot without even needing to put this into a complex uh, lighting algorithm. This is in a complex lighting algorithm. There's parts of this that are obviously glowing and things like that, but um, there's still a whole lot of stuff that's being done here that looks really good just from textures. So, looking a little closer at how textures are working in the OpenGL pipeline. So, taking some images from Learn OpenGL, first thing we're going to do, before we can start using our texture, we need OpenGL and our graphics card to have our texture. This is a very similar process to the other things that we've done where we are going to give a buffer of information to our graphics card, right? Same kind of thing. We've got a big chunk of memory and we load it onto our graphics card. If you want to, you can actually do this by um, explicitly <laughs> um, typing in RGB data and depending on how big your texture is going to be, uh, typing in a whole bunch of um, uh, RGB, RGB sets um, and then uploading them as a buffer to your graphics card. However, that is not a workflow we're generally going to follow. We're not going to be manually typing in, um, uh, typing in individual pixels of color data. Um, in textures, we actually call them texels, not pixels, um, because they are they're, they're not the same. A pixel is something that appears on your screen. A texel is actually a color where you're going to pull color information from. So I'm going to start calling them texels, not pixels. But we're going to load our image into OpenGL. Code details will be in the tutorials. I'm not going to go through the code for this particular thing, because, especially because it's quite repetitive of um, the way that we would set up other buffers in, uh, in our graphics card. But what we're going to do is sample from the textures using a coordinate system for between 0 and 1. So this is quite interesting um, because this takes us away from the idea that the texture size has some particular relevance to the size of the objects the texture is going to be used for. Um, it does have some relevance, but it's not a close enough idea that we could say an object is a certain number of texels long, or an object has a certain number of texels in order to wrap um, the texture around it. We're not, we're getting ourselves away from that and saying, no, it's more of a ratio. So it's more of us saying that this object uses an entire texture from the top to the bottom. So it has the texture coordinates going between zero and one, and it gets going between zero and one across it as well. So here is a triangle and each of the verts has certain texture coordinates. So the bottom left is zero, zero, the top is half one, and the right side is one, zero. And the texture coordinates at the corners are zero, one, 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 zero, zero, and one, zero. So this triangle is mapped right out to the edges of this texture. Um, and the texture here just happens to be some, some paving tiles 
Um, so this is like we're looking down on a triangle worth of paving tiles from above here. So you can kind of see how we've taken the image here and we've mapped parts of the image to some of the verts here. And then our fragment shader is just dealing with it for us uh, and interpolating across this triangle, interpolating these texture coordinates across these triangles. So if we took, looked at this point in the middle, it would be um, exactly part way between the texture coordinates for the three corners here, and it would be half half. And that way it would sample the very center of the texture. So good for us. We don't have to think about it too much. Um, all we need to do is say where the corners map to the texture and the fragment shader is going to deal with all of the points in between for us and pick up information from the texture, um, pick up color information from the texture and apply that color information to particular fragments that we can see on the screen. However, things do get interesting because we can use textures in different ways. So I said we're sampling textures between 0 and 1. But what happens if we go outside of 0 and 1? And and this might be weird because you're just like, why would you go outside, zero, outside of 0 and 1? There, there is no image there. But the thing is, we can actually go outside of 0 and 1 and still get something. So there's actually different settings that you can use uh, in OpenGL that change the sampling behavior depending on whether we're wrapping around the outside of the texture or not. Um, and this isn't just a mistake. This isn't just covering for the idea that we accidentally sampled outside of the space of zero to one. Because if we wanted to, we could we could basically mathematically make sure that none of the verts ever sample outside of zero and one. We could be just really careful with how we do these things. Um, but sometimes we actually do these things on purpose because we can use repeated textures um, and they'll still get us something interesting. So we can change our sample behavior so that when we go outside of zero and one, so for example, here it could be zero to one and here it could be one to two and here it could be two to three. And it's using this same texture multiple times um, because we've just gone outside of our texture coordinates. We're gonna do this intentionally sometimes. So this one here called geo repeat um, is the default. Um, so this is the basic behavior. So once you go off the edge of the texture, um, and this is very, very much like sort of integer maths in a sense where um, we, we, we ignore part of the, um, part of the value. So anything outside of zero to one, we're going to ignore. So this is like 2.5. We're just going to ignore the two and take the 0. 0.5. And this is like, uh, here it's like, oh, here it's like one and a half, one and a half. We ignore both the ones, but we still take the halves. So we're still mapping ourselves onto the texture. We're just ignoring any value, uh, that's larger than one that is in our texture coordinates, but we're using all of the decimal places. So it's like the opposite of like in integer, integer maths in a sense. Um, so repeat is just going to say, oh, we're just going to keep using the texture again, same way it's using, um, mirrored repeat is interesting. So you'll go through the texture, it's like this. And then when you get off the end of the texture, instead of it just copying the texture across, it will flip the texture around in a sense. And then you'll go across the opposite direction of the texture. And then it will flip the texture around again and you go the opposite direction again through the texture. There's a reason for this. Um, clamp to edge says, if you wanted to go off the edge, we will just take the line of pixels, the last line of pixels that we saw, and we'll continue that off into infinity. And clamp to border says, um, outside of this texture, you did not want to be outside of this texture. So we're going to give you a particular color outside the edge, and that's all it's going to be. Um, so there are reasons why we might use this kind of thing. So repeat is the default. Um, so Kathy's asking, by sampling past zero and one, do you mean to only sample a part of the image? Um, so sampling zero one is like going off the edge of the image. So for example, this texture here, so the texture coordinates zero to one means the texture finishes on the border of this. But what if I sample out here on the texture? So what is OpenGL going to do if I'm no longer sampling on the texture? I start sampling outside the texture. So this is what happens. It's like, oh, you, you went outside the texture. We're just going to like place like the idea of the texture again there. And then you can sample again in the texture. So this is if we're using sampling coordinates, texture coordinates that are outside of zero to one. So if we repeat, 
These are the kinds of things where we could do stuff with repeating patterns, um, but we want them to be in the same kind of alignment. So one of the easiest things to think about for this is constructed surfaces. So if I'm going to be using wallpaper for something, my texture coordinates could go from like one to one to thirty across a um, across an entire wall looking at how wallpaper repeats itself because of the way that it's printed or something like a wire mesh gate or something like that. Maybe I don't want to have a really big texture for a wire mesh gate. I've got a small texture of wire mesh that just repeats multiple times. Uh, brick walls are also a decent example of that kind of thing. Mirrored repeat does something different. So mirrored repeat means that with two parts of the texture, so I sample zero to one here, and I sample like one to two here, example, that's like in the X coordinate of the, the texture. What I want is these two next to each other to not have a clear line between them. So I don't want to be able to see that there's a line between them. So if I flip it, the pixels that line up next to each other there, because I flipped it, are exactly the same color pixels on both of the textures. So here we can kind of see because it's an image that there's one texture here and then one next to it except the place where they line up doesn't appear like a solid line because the colors match each other on either side of the line whereas here you can kind of see the edges between these textures because the colors don't match up so mirrored repeat allows you to um to have this kind of smooth gradient between copies of the same texture um i had a uh I was going to actually copy paste one of these, but I thought I would um, show you seamless grass texture. So, <laughs> so many of these exist. We use these all the time when we're making any games that have grass. Um, we have these textures. Um, and if we use mirrored repeat on these textures, we get all the pixels on this side of the texture. Let's just like zoom in on this and we go, okay. All the pixels on this side of the texture are going to match the next one because we just flip it. And then this patch of grass is hopefully, you can usually pick up on it because you see patterns anyway, but it's hopefully going to look like it's all just one big patch of grass. Um, you could play any game that you, that you know has grass in it. Find a large enough area of grass where people haven't covered it up with things like rocks or bushes and stuff like that, and try to look for the repeating patterns in the grass texture. You will find them. Um, especially the older the game is, the easier it is to find um, the repeating patterns of grass. Like you'll find this section here that has a bit more light brown in it, or this clump here that has a particular pattern. And then you can look around your game and just be like, how many times can I find this same pattern in the game? And it's likely to be like, you know, hundreds of times in the game, you're going to find the same thing. Okay. Um, so that's what we would do with a mirrored repeat. Uh, clamp to edge is kind of funny. Because, <laughs> to be honest, I've never used it. And I'm not actually sure what the artistic reason is behind clamp to edge, other than some situations where you know that you're not going to sample the texture perfectly. You know you're going off the texture a little bit, but you want it to just remain looking good enough. You know, looking close enough that it doesn't necessarily um, uh, that it doesn't necessarily appear that you've gone off the edge of the texture. Um, yeah, Sam's also saying it's clamped edge feels like a potential safety measure. You know, the funny thing about it is like when I'm working on, on, on stuff like graphics edge and stuff, I tend to use the opposite. Um, I don't use clamp to edge because if there's something wrong with my texture sampling and my texture coordinates, um, I want to know, you know, so has anyone ever seen this? Um, when you're you're playing a game or something like that and just for a moment something appears fully bright green or fully bright bright purple like a magenta um fully bright that often happens when the programmer has said if we if the textures didn't load properly 
or we're sampling the textures incorrectly, we want this debug information. So we want to visually see really, really clearly where our textures have failed. And so you get this bright purple thing somewhere. And if you ever see bright purple when you're testing the game and stuff, you say, oh, there's a texture missing. Uh, it's missing from this type of rock that's here in this scene. And we'll go back through our code and say, why is that texture missing? Oh, we forgot to load that texture in. If we do something like clamp to edge, we don't, we, we'll go, we're going to be covering up our, um, our texturing mistakes in a sense. So I actually use clamp to border, um, for when I'm watching out for texturing mistakes. And I specifically say that the border is like a bright purple. And that way, if we, um, did I close the, oh no, sorry, I closed the, the grass one. So if you've got all this nice green grass, naturally green grass, and then you have these strips around the sides here and there of bright purple, um, then you know that you haven't done your texture um, sampling properly. And you're like, okay, well, we need to go in and figure that out. Or you know that one of your textures hasn't loaded because if the border is purple and it doesn't load, then, um, then the whole thing's gonna end up purple. So little tricks like that are things that we use. But clamp to border on its own, if we're not using it as like an error checking kind of thing. Um, we might use this for stuff like posters and stickers. So these, potentially, I don't know if they are or they aren't, going to be clamped to border. I mean, if you're sampling these exactly, you, you don't even need clamp to border. You just go, this is the texture, you know. But clamp to border is often, if we want something to exist once only, we never want it to repeat. Um, and if we sample outside of it by accident, um, we will get a, like a colored border around it. So things that are only going to appear once, maybe posters and stickers, decals and stuff like that. And the border around the outside of the texture might actually be transparent or something. So we could do that. If we're putting a texture on top of a surface that has another texture underneath, you can actually do this. You can do, um, for example, let's go back to this one because it's easy. Um, this here, or this design here, these painted designs that look like they're spray paint. Oh, here's one, here's a good one. Deck B here. This might be a texture on its own, the word Deck B, separate from the surface texture that is on all these walls. So the surface texture on these walls might be a repeated generic gray texture. And they may be using two textures on this surface here. One, which is done first, which is the gray surface. Then on top of it, the decal that we'd say on top of this deck B. And so deck B might be a clamp to edge decal so that it only um, ever has the words once, uh, the letters once, uh, and they might be these colors with some, some transparency on them so you can see what's behind it. Little things like that. Like this, we're getting into like kind of complex stuff here, but you know, the basics that I'm gonna teach you, you can just sort of build it up. Uh, so single texture is how we're going to start, but the idea that we could put multiple textures on an object is not that far-fetched. In fact, <laughs> we'll be doing it in a couple of weeks anyway. <laughs> okay, so that's how we might use different um, texture mapping options. But there's also this thing called texture filtering. So, as I said before, texels and pixels, not the same thing. A texel is color sample information. A pixel is a is a genuine one-to-one -one mapping to the little lights in your monitor that show you stuff. So if it's a not not a one-to-one -one match between fragments and 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 texels, um, what does it mean if we sample the texels and we're not necessarily getting a really clear match? between the fragment and a texel. So if we if we, we blow, blow up our texels, they're, they're these squares of color. You know, so if I've got a square of color and my fragment says, based on my linear interpolation of one to zero, I'm gonna come across these texels and I'm gonna pick up information. Is there a difference between where I, whether I'm at the top of this texel or the bottom of this texel? Is there a difference if I'm sampling right on the edge or the middle of the texel? And it can actually make a difference. So. OpenGL has two options for this that you can see here. One is GL nearest. So GL nearest is just saying, um, when you sample into the texture, um, your zero to one um, coordinate for the fragment that you're on may land somewhere in a texel. So if you just go nearest, you go, what is the closest center of a texel that I'm near? And you just take that texel. And this 
this example has been specifically done um, in a situation where multiple pixels are picking up the same texel so that you can see this really clearly. So if multiple, so if the texel is this big and each of the fragments is going one, two, three, four in here, and then it moves on to the next one, one, two, three, four, something like that, you can get this situation where multiple pixels are in the same texel. So the, the, the kind of the resolution of the texel ends up being expanded into multiple pixels on your screen enough that you can see them and it gets really jaggy like this. So we can see all of these edges that were in the texel. And that's what if we, we take GL nearest. But another thing we can do is we can linearly interpolate within the, um, within the texture itself. So instead of only taking um, one texel, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do, I think, um, I think it's good if I draw this. So here's my texture and I'm going to separate my texture specifically into its texels. Um, and let's say I've got like one vert start sampling here, another vert starts sampling there, and it's going to carry across those texels. Let's fill some of these in with colors. Oops. No, that's all right. They're all orange. <laughs> and those are all blue. Okay. So as I move across sampling here, I should have used different colors. Um, I might sample one texel here and I get orange. One texel till there, one texel here one texel here, and I need to decide what colors each of these fragments are going to be. So if I am sampling which, um, which colors nearest is going to say, this fragment is orange, this fragment is orange, this fragment is blue, this fragment is blue, and let's just do another one down here. And this fragment is white. Um, and so that's fine. We're going, we're just going to take an exact sampling of the colors. But if we do that, we're probably going to end up in a situation where we get this jagginess here, where the idea of this line being diagonal does not actually carry through very well. But instead, what we could do is we can go linear, where we take an interpolation between the colors, where I say, this one in particular here, yes, I'm in blue, but I'm very close to white. So this particular texel might render a fragment color. So it's literally called frag color. It frag color. Again, it's spelt this way because this is actually the keyword in OpenGL. Um, might be, uh, hang on, hang on. I'm gonna close this so I don't accidentally paint the whole area. Uh, it might look like this. It might be a paler blue because it takes some influence from the white as well as influence from the blue there. So right on the edge, the boundary between two colors um, in the texels, the pixels might actually show that by saying, um, when we're at the edge, we don't make hard edges, we blend between colors. So you get something out of this in that the, the nearest is gonna get you this really, really crisp image but any kind of image artifacts that are in the um, the texture itself, they're going to be amplified um, in the um, in the pixels and the fragments. Fragments, pixels, same, basically the same thing. Um, linear here is going to smooth out the edges of things, um, and so you're going to get these smooth boundaries between things. But the issue you're going to get there is too much smoothing. Um, takes away the crispness of something and the precision of something. Um, so both of these examples look bad, <laughs> which is tough. Are oh, people talking about linear filtering? Yeah, I think the bilinear, as far as, far as I remember, I think the bilinear is when we're using these mip maps and we're doing linear across the two dimensions of the um, texture and across a third dimension into different textures. Let me talk about what these things are before we go into that. 
I think that's what bilinear filtering is. <laughs> I'd have to look it up. Um, okay, so but if both of those filtering options look bad, it's because there's a fundamental issue um, going. Oh, that was trilinear. Sorry, I'm jumping between my linears. Let me let me explain the basics first. Okay, the reason why both of these look bad is because we're getting multiple fragments accessing the same texel. So multiple screen pixels are all looking at the same um, texel, which means that the resolution of what we end up putting up on screen is lower than the screen's resolution. And we need to just kind of kind of upscale the image in some way. So nearest is going to upscale it so all the pixels look gigantic. Linear is going to upscale it so that everything looks really fuzzy. So it's neither of these is a good compromise. What we really want, the ideal thing that we can get is one fragment will sample a single texel. And when we move on to the next frag fragment, we'll move immediately to the next texel. So the closer we can get to the texels ending up appearing exactly one-to-one -one on screen, the better our textures are going to look. Because, you know, looking at something in the resolution that it was painted at or designed at is, is much better than... Um, uh, than than having to having to blow a, a texel up onto multiple pixels so that means our textures need to be sized based on the object but how can we possibly do that like so far in the demos we've done in our first tutorials yes our objects are fixed to our screen size in a sense um, so they don't change size but we're going to get pretty quickly into a 3d world where if we can move around then objects change in size. The closer we are to something, the bigger it gets. The further away we are, the smaller it gets. We're going to have this kind of perspective. That's a key word. We're going to work on that later. On our world, right? So if they're going to change size, then how do we actually get this ideal one fragment for one texel? And this is this thing called mipmaps. I looked, I tried to look at what mipmap actually means, but I don't know. I don't know if it's an acronym for something, but yeah. So mipmaps are actually multiple textures that are of the same uh, idea, I guess. The same real world object or the same character or something like that. But what you get is we have a full size texture and then we have a texture that's half the size of that. And then we have a texture that's half the size of that. And then another texture that's half the size, half the size, half the size, until you get small enough, then you go, okay, texture's so small, we're not going to bother sampling at that level. Um, and then, depending on how far away we are from the object, we use a different texture. So if we're really, really far away from the object, um, we will just use one of these, off in the distance textures. If we're really close, we use one of these. And then we get our computer to basically, it's not our computer, it's our graphics card, to decide how much of this texture, based on the texture coordinates, is um, is being seen at a particular time, um, and how many fragments are going to get used for this, and then we use the appropriate size texture um, based on those numbers. So based on the um, resolution of the texture and the number of fragments per texel that we're currently sampling. And it's interesting because this gets us this kind of outcome. So if we do not have mip mapping, and we're sampling, I'm pretty sure this is sampling nearest, so this is sampling all of these texels on nearest, we get this, um, what's it called, moiring, I think, um, where because of our sample pattern on this thing as it goes off into the distance, sometimes you get this banding where it's always picking up the, the, the black or the white of this checkerboard in awkward ways, and it starts to make it actually look unrealistic as it sort of goes off into the distance. Um, if we use mip mapping, we can say, we want this thing to degrade gracefully as it goes off into the distance. So what we do is like, we have points where we cross over between different resolutions. You can actually see the distance points. So you can actually see this curved line here. So there are still artifacts, even with mip mapping. But you can kind of see there's a boundary between two different detail levels of texture here. And there's another boundary between two detail levels at the back here. So you can actually see we're switching between these half, halving our texture size each time. But at least what we're getting is a sort of 
a graceful degradation of quality as we go off into the distance. So this looks more realistically like a checkerboard pattern going off to the distance, whereas this looks like a, I don't understand what is happening. This is no longer reality. Um, and things like this are the, the issues that we sometimes um, pull ourselves out of a believable world for our players or our, our moviegoers if something like this starts appearing. So mint mapping is pretty good. Um, we can actually get rid of some of these things um, by um, by doing what I just described before, which is trilinear, which is where we would sample from, say, these two textures at the same time at their texture coordinates and use a, a mix between them. Okay, um, what are we, 1052? I'm gonna take a break now before we go into matrix transforms. Um, I think, you know what? I knew there was something I was missing. When I finished off the slides last night, I was like, do I have a break slide? I don't actually have a break slide. I just did topics. Like it's, it's all right. The content is complete, but I didn't actually have something, you know, funny or interesting or an anecdotal for a break, uh, for this lecture. So. Good time to break now uh, before we get into um, matrix transformation. So we're going to be doing a refresher on linear algebra. It's not going to be a great refresher because I'm not going to teach you maths, um, but I'm going to teach you. I'm going to do some of it, but then I'm going to I'm going to show you how we're going to use it uh, in graphics. So we're at 10:54 by my clock now. We'll come back at 10:59 and jump into the maths of altering vertices. I mean, it's the math, the maths of transforming vertices. <laughs> I mean, I should just use the real word, but I'm just trying to describe it in such a way. Okay, so we'll be back in five minutes' time. We're still on break. Don't worry. I just 
something's happening and I just wanted to show you. Look at this little thing. She's like... It's so cute sometimes when she curls up to the point where she's like upside down and she's just this little um little ball of cat anyway i just want to show you that because i know that people love chicken <laughs> Exa said nose cam i must have been aiming that right up my nose before i actually changed it to chicken All right, well, that was pretty much break over. So, oh, actually, no, I said we'd come back at 10.59, so we'll come back exactly when I said, rather than, um, in case people are, are taking really specific time breaks. All right, it's 10.59 now, so we can continue with the lecture. So, Matrix Transforms. So, two ways this joke could have gone. I could have gone uh, the joke on the Matrix, or I could have gone the joke on Transform, and I have opted for the joke on Transform. So I could have done this uh, mid to late 90s or early 80s, and I opted for early 80s. So up until this point, our vertices have kind of been set in stone. Not exactly, like we could change them if we want to. Um, but it's hard for us to kind of move the verts around. What we will be doing is um, basically just rewriting the vertex position data. So what wouldn't it be more interesting <laughs> if these uh, if, if vertices were more than meets the eye? Maybe we should roll out a new technique to change the position of vertices. <laughs> Sorry, I just can't help it. Uh, anyway, these jokes were all based on transformers, uh, which is I don't want to say I don't I don't want to say this is a great TV series to go back and watch because um, I myself and a couple of friends have actually tried every now and then going back and watching TV series from when we were children and um, nostalgia makes you think things are a lot better than they are and and like there's a limit to how well a four year old can judge uh, <laughs> Now, the artistry of TV, right? And so we loved it. Uh, but look, sometimes it's better not to go back. You can just ruin your memories of something. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> anyway, so if we wanted to move vertices around, we could, if we want to, just write new vertex positions. So what we do is we take, we take the vertex buffer and that's got our, our entire kind of information about a particular shape. Your vertex buffers at the moment have been probably manageable, right? There's only three or four vertices in the buffer because all we've worked with so far is triangles and rectangles. However, <laughs> where are we? I, I do have a 3D. Oh, wait, well, let's look at this one. Okay, this, this gun here, the vertex buffer for this gun, I'm going to ballpark, ballpark this gun at, about a thousand vertices and that's because it's a simple mechanical model there's not many curves in it uh, even the curves here are simulated curves there's not going to be that many um verts in it although this curve is quite quite smooth so it probably does have quite a few verts in it but either way maybe it's probably more than a thousand because this thing's if it's going to take up this much of the screen we're going to want detail and it's probably going to be like you know i don't know I'm really ballparking here like 5,000 verts or something like that. Um, we don't want to screw around with 5,000 verts um, because if we're going to screw around with 5,000 verts, say 60 times a second, we're going to have to keep some kind of monumental calculations going about where these verts should be whenever this thing moves. Um, so yes, it is technically possible for us to refresh <laughs> the the vertex buffer object 60 times a second in the code that we write and just go all right now move everything a little bit over here and stuff like that yes technically possible um this is a bit cumbersome for us to do manually so instead 
we use matrices to do these things. So I just said matrix of leadership. Yeah, this is again a Transformers quote. For anyone who doesn't know Transformers, um, sometimes I, I like, sometimes I just quote things. Um, but when I'm quoting something from 1984, I think the original Transformers was like 82 or 83 even. I figure I should probably explain it. <laughs> Like some, I, I think some of Transformers predates when I was born as well, so it's a little bit excessive. But matrices, part of linear algebra, gives us really, really easy tools for changing vectors. And a vector is a series of floats. Well, could be integers as well. But for in our in our case, um, because everything that we're doing on the graphics card is going to be floats, so I'm going to think of them as floats. So. A vector being a three-dimensional float or a four-dimensional float or something like that is really, really similar to the vertex data we're using because our vertex data is basically a vector. It's an X, Y, and a Z. Uh, well, we haven't used the Z yet because we've been in two dimensions, but I think even in two dimensions, we're just using a Z of zero. Um, so the fact that we have three numerical coordinates means that we can use matrices to transform these things. Um, so the question I have now is how well do you remember your linear algebra? Because we're not going to go over it. I'm not reteaching your linear algebra. The whole point of a university is that people teach what they know how to teach, and I do not know how to teach linear algebra. So we're not going to go over it, but if you need to refresh things, um, these are the things to look up. Uh, vector arithmetic, so we are going to be doing things like adding vectors together, subtracting vectors from each other. It's actually pretty simple. You could refresh this in like 10 minutes. Um, but dot product and cross product and normalization of vectors are things that we're going to be doing a fair bit later on. So dot product, we're going to be doing heaps when we're doing lighting calculations. Uh, cross product, we're going to be using um, a fair bit when we're working with cameras, virtual cameras in scenes. Um, potentially a little bit when we're doing complex model hierarchy and stuff like that as well. Um, actually, I'm not sure if we will. Anyway, and normalization, that also goes back into lighting. So some of those things, just look them up. Um, you know, if you've learned it before, it shouldn't be that hard to remember them. Um, and also, you can also think of these things, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what they actually mean to us. And so you can think of them, I always remember them by the context of how I'm going to use them, not necessarily the context of how they work mathematically. Uh, matrix arithmetic, multiplying matrices by other matrices and multiplying vectors by matrices. We're going to be using both of these things. I'm going to show them today. I am not manually going to multiply any matrices though. So we are not delving to that level, um, but if you know it, you'll understand. Actually, maybe we will. I said I wasn't going to, but I think we should do one or two manually. We'll see how time's going in the lecture. I'm going to keep one eye on the clock. Um, so vectors we can think of as directions measured by coordinates. I'm going to need, I'm going to need my Microsoft Paint, I think, for this stuff. So if I have a coordinate system like so, these are all vectors. They're all basically directions. So each of these is going to have a set of coordinates for how far they are going in a particular direction. And so this one here might be going, for example, um, I don't know, I'm just making up the coordinates here. It's like four across and one high. So its X coordinate is four and its Y coordinate is one. And this is just a two dimensional vector space here. I should actually list my axes correctly. I'm a little loose with my math. Um, so this thing is a vector that goes a certain distance. This vector here would be like a zero in the X and negative. I'm just going to say five. I'm just making up the numbers, but you know what I mean? So vectors define directions in coordinate geometry. Um, if we put all of these vectors, um, and instead of allowing them to just kind of start anywhere in space, um, if we were to I'm gonna pick a color, if we take this vector and move the start of the vector to zero, zero, this point would end up moving and it would exactly be at the point four, one. So the vector can be thought of as a direction in maths, but if we base all our vectors at zero, um, 
we can use these to represent the coordinate spaces that we're in. So each of our vertices can be thought of as a vector that starts at zero. Um, and that's how it just represents the position in space that it is. Um, so if we're going to be using vectors in a visual sense, um, I like to think about vectors in a visual sense as well. So adding two vectors together, for example, is like following them on a journey. We follow one vector from zero, zero to where it goes. And then we follow the other vector from the end where we ended up in that to where we're going. There's actually an image here of this. So if I'm adding the vectors V and K together here, V takes us from to four, two K takes us, um, K actually would have started here and ended up here, but to add them together, we start at, at the end of the last one that adds our vectors together. Subtracting allows us to look at two vectors and see how far apart their points are, their endpoints are. So subtracting nearly is like, you know, the other word for subtracting is the difference between things. This is the difference between the vectors. So it's saying how far apart are these two vectors? And we'll actually get another vector out of this, which says, you know, you would have to travel from here to here to get between these two vectors things like that. Um, dot product, um, I don't have a picture of this one because it's, it's hard to visualize it, but the interesting thing about dot product is um, two vectors, if they're aiming exactly the same direction, are going to give us a dot product of one. Uh, two vectors that are exactly 90 degrees apart from each other, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> we've got to remember this, gives us a dot product of half. I think, and if they're pointing directly away from each other, they give a dot product of zero or of negative one. I can't remember. Yeah, but it's got to do with the similar thing as the um, the circle geometry stuff. Right, the dot product is zero if they're 90 degrees, um, and then it's negative one if they're pointing directly away from each other. The cool thing about this is a dot product actually gives us a really, really quick and easy way to say how much two vectors are aimed similarly to each other. So we get a, a really um, easy way of numerically saying, do these things aim in the same direction or do these things aim nearly in the same direction, but not quite by a certain magnitude. So dot product's really good when we are, for example, bouncing light off objects and trying to figure out how bright that light should be. Because if a light's bouncing directly off something back into our eyes, it should be brighter than if it's bouncing kind of like off the edge of a surface or something. So we're going to be using that heaps in lighting. Not yet, but I mention it because we're going to need to use it. Cross product's interesting because it takes two vectors and gives us another vector that is orthogonal, perpendicular. I wrote perpendicular in the slides and said orthogonal. Um, 90 degrees to the other two. Um, this is useful for us because sometimes what we're going to want to do is build up an axis like the X, Y, Z axis, but we're going to build up these in, in arbitrary positions. Um, so sometimes, so long as we have two vectors, we can build a third vector, which is like vertical to those two or like orthogonal to those two, and then build another one so that we have an exactly set of three that are all 90 degrees off each other. And we build our kind of X, Y, Z coordinate space because we're actually going to be able to have different coordinate spaces existing in one world of coordinates. It's it's a little messy now to think about, but we will get there eventually. So some of these things we can think of visually, um, some of the things we know we're going to use in a visual sense and stuff. So you can already see how like I was even forgetting how, like what the, the proper result of the dot product is because I don't use it necessarily for its mathematical um, properties, but I, well, actually, no, we do definitely use it for its mathematical properties. I don't remember everything about it, but I can still use it, um, to do lighting equations and stuff like that. Okay. So some of this stuff, we're going to be thinking about it from the perspective of its purpose, uh, rather than necessarily a perspective of exactly how that's going to be working. Um, Oh yeah, Simon's saying, yeah, the, the cross product thing only works in, in three dimensions. It's okay though, because uh, we are not going to go into four dimensional rendering. Um, I don't think we're quite ready for that. Uh, if we were to do a course that followed on from, from this graphics course, we would probably look at four dimensional stuff. Um, and I know that's weird because we don't generally see the world in four dimensions. Um, 
but the fourth dimension is actually pretty handy for certain types of techniques. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into detail on that. I don't need to blow up people's minds when I'm trying to teach you maths. So one of the things that we're going to do a lot of the time with matrices. So I'm not going to explain what a matrix is. Matrix is. I'm hoping everyone remembers what a matrix is. It's just a grid of numbers. We can multiply a vector by a matrix. Um, multiplying the vector by the matrix is our capability to change the numbers in the vector using certain things in the matrix. So what we're going to be doing is um, multiplying the matrix by the vector, uh, the vector by the matrix, this, the order actually counts, um, and that results in a vector, which means that the only things that we're going to do, we're not going to change the number of dimensions in the vector, but we are going to change the values in the vector, which means if the vector happens to be a vertex, what we're going to be doing is changing its position somewhere in the world. And that's pretty trivial, moving a vector around in the world. If we want to just move one um, vert in the world, we would just change its position. But what's even cooler than that is if we apply the same matrix, so the same what we're going to call transform matrix, which I'm going to show you in a moment what they are. If we apply the same transformation to all the verts in a shape, we will move the entire shape in a particular way. So that's not just moving it. We can warp the shape itself in a way that actually kind of... Um, uh, in a way that makes sense to us from the way that we're using these things. So I'm going to, I'm going to have to explain what they are and then work through an example rather than just go, yeah, all this stuff's going to change. So we have some pre-made transform matrices, some particular setups, and we're going to be using them heaps in graphics. So you may have heard of this kind of, uh, holy trinity of, of transforms called scale, translate, and rotate. Anyone's that's used, um, stuff like, uh, I don't know, I'm thinking like SketchUp or even Photoshop and stuff like that. You're going to have seen scale and rotate and translate um, because it works in, in two-dimensional and three-dimensional um, situations. Uh, but before we get into those matrices themselves, I want to talk about vectors in OpenGL. So vectors of verts in OpenGL. And it's weird um, because, as I said, a two-dimensional vector had two values. So I, I literally did it with just two values here, an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. Um, and three dimensions should have three values, an X, Y, and a Z. Um, but in OpenGL, there's always going to be this thing called the W, um, which is the final coordinate in each of these things. Um, for the moment, the only thing we're going to be doing with this final coordinate is leaving it at one. Um, so it's not going to make a difference now, but it is actually going to, we're going to use that because it makes it easier for us to, to do our matrix transforms. Like some of our matrix transforms you're going to see actually are going to leverage that one in a way. Actually, I don't know if they're going to, but they are going to leverage the extra dimension of the, um, no, no, they are going to use the one. Yeah. <laughs> and in more subtlety, this one will actually, um, be used, I think as other numbers once we do more complicated transforms. But anyway, the easy way to think about it is in two dimensional space, we add an extra dimension to our vectors and it's just going to be one for now. And in three dimensional space, we also add an extra dimension to our vectors and it's going to be one. This allows us to do our transforms more easily. And later on, it's actually going to allow us to do important things like the perspective transform, which is our ability to put a viewpoint in our scene and have it be able to like move around and see things from different angles. We'll get to that later. Um, so the first one of these is changing the size of an object. I'm going to get all mathy. I'm going to use like a, the equivalent of a whiteboard. Let's um, get a new one here. Don't need to save that. So first one is scale. So scale is going to change the size of an object for the moment. I'm only going to show you things in two dimensions because we're working in two dimensions for now, but these matrices are going to expand to three dimensions. It just gets an extra row and a column. Um, and some of them expand nicely with the extra row and column. So scale expands nicely into 3D. Um, translate, which is moving something around, also expands nicely into 3D. Uh, rotate does not expand nicely into 3D. So we're going to chill 
on the 3D matrices for now. And we're going to work in 2D and then we're going to build these up later. I mean, it's not going to be long. It's going to be like next week or the week after that we'll add more things to this. But for now, we're going to work in 2D. Okay, so scale X, scale Y, and 1. Let's, um, let's show you that working. So I've got my matrix here. Scale X, scale Y, and 1. Everything else was 0. I'm not going to do this for all of the matrices. Let's just do it for one of them. I'm just going to remind you how to do, how to work the matrix. So, so let's say our X is 2. And our, our Y is 1. So if I'm going to scale something to double in X and... Um, and singly in Y, what I'm expecting to happen is in this coordinate space here, if I have an object that's sitting here, I expect it to get twice as far away from the X axis that it was before. If I have an object that is here, I expect it not to move because it's on the x-axis, it's on the zero, you can't multiply zero by anything. So let's take this point here, simple point uh, is going to be the point one, one, which is a vector one, one, and the w is one. So <laughs> you can see I'm making my maths easy for myself here. Um, if you remember, I'm assuming that most ever, everyone else in the course other than me has done this more recently than I have. So this is a funny example. So I always remember that the way we're going to do this is what, what we do is I always remember when we're multiplying matrices, it's rows and columns. So row multiplied by column. So two times one plus zero times one plus zero times one equals two. Uh, this one, zero times one plus one times one is one plus zero times one. So that is one. And this one here, zero times one, zero times one, one times one. So what we end up being getting is that this coordinate moved from one, one to two, one, because it got scaled twice as far away from the X axis. Okay. This one here, we could actually do the same thing. So let's say this one was, uh, zero three and we try to scale this double in the x coordinate what we would get is what is it zero three one so two times zero zero times three zero times one is equal to zero so let's i'm just going to say scale times by that um and this one here is zero times zero one times three zero times one zero times zero zero times three one times one so as we can see the scaling transform that is trying to push these things twice as far away from the x-axis that they were this works in negative as well um so if i had another dot say here it would then go out this way and end up there and the one in the center doesn't move. So mathematically, we can see how this works. But visually, what we can see is I've just put, um, I've just made a triangle here. And if I scale it double in the x axis, it turns into a much wider triangle. So we're going from that to that. Um, so that's, that's basically what we're doing here. The scale transform is able to, um, expand the width of an object or expand the height of an object or expand both of them at the same time. I think that's the limit of how much math I'm going to do. Someone say, could we get Dan Mansfield as a guest lecturer? <laughs> I should have called him up and just gotten him to teach this bit. That'd be, that would have, that would have been really funny, actually. I'm pretty sure he has actual work to do rather than guest lecturing super simple maths for me, where all I'm doing is a refresher on these things. But the important thing to me is not the numbers up here. So this part of it, the top half of the screen, not that important. The bottom half of the screen where the triangle becomes twice as wide as it was before is the thing that is important. 
right? So what we're doing is we're not worried too much about the maths, but what we're worried about is the graphical implications of the maths. So that is scale. Scale can work in either of those dimensions and you've seen the maths of it working. I'm not gonna do the maths for the others as well. Um, <laughs> translate, um, and, and also important, if we apply this to multiple verts in the object at the same time, that will change the size of the object in different dimensions, right? So we've, we've seen the difference between one object, uh, one vert just moves, but applying the same matrix to multiple verts changes them in different ways, which is important. Uh, translate's actually more simple. Uh, translate a matrix moves the points by a fixed amount. So if we apply this matrix to something, um, the saving stuff so let's say I've got a cube that's here and I do translate um, I don't know for one that's exactly the same vector I used previously so for one is a vector like so what we're gonna end up with is uh, oh you know what I do this much <laughs> Uh, what I'm trying to show is the shape doesn't change. There you go. And we take this vector. Oops. And it's just moved the object. So the translate in that direction is just going to move the object. So I'm not even going to bother with the maths now. I'm just going to look at how the, the effect that this thing has. So it's going to take the same object. It is not going to change the properties of the object itself, but all of the coordinates in the object of all the verts in the object are going to shift uh, to somewhere, but they're all going to get shifted by exactly the same amount. So um, the property of this matrix is it moves every single point by the same amount of X and the same amount of Y. So the whole object can go from somewhere to somewhere else. Um, <laughs> people are like, we're, we're on a big Dan Mansfield uh, appreciation point here. That's really nice. Dan's really good. He's, he's a good friend. PK Beam's asking, how does translate matrix work when W is not one? I think the answer to that is that the translation matrix will not work when W is not one because the translate is actually relying on the W, I think. Yeah, it is. It's relying on the W being one. If the W is not one, it's going to um, change the magnitude of the translation. So, I mean, like... <laughs> Simple answer from Simon. I think I probably should have said that. It just, it simply doesn't work. Um, which is why the, one of the reasons why the W of one exists, uh, and why the vectors for vertices are always going to have that one there just to simplify all our maths. Rotate is another one. And this is an interesting one because what rotate will do is it will rotate an object around zero, zero. So the, the interesting thing is this is guaranteed no matter what, um, uh, what angle we put into this, it's guaranteed to not squish or, or scale or do anything weird to our object. The object will remain feeling to us humans as the same object while it rotates. It's pretty simple. Um, situation so i can have an object like so oh this is going to be wait, wait 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 there is a way that i can do this okay we've got that object there i don't think i can do this with the axes actually i'm not even sure i could do this in paint no i don't have a um I don't have a smooth rotate here. I can actually do it in my slides. Hang on, hang on. Let's start screwing around with slides. Here's a shape. Oops. Screwing around the slides too much. Here is a rectangle. <laughs> if I want to rotate this, it's really funny because we can just do this 
graphically like this, but in the background, there's probably actually matrix transforms happening here. Um, cause I doubt they would do this explicitly. Um, but you can actually see the angle that we're going at here. This is doing the same thing that the, um, the rotate transformation would be doing. So it's the idea that if we apply the same rotation transform to each of the four verts in this particular rectangle, I love how I'm just using the drawing tools in my slides to do this, but it totally works. Um, this will move all of the points. This is assuming at the moment that the, um, the origin of my, um, uh, the, the origin of my coordinate system is in the center of this object, which is not always going to be the case. I actually have pictures of this later. So um, this is going to allow us to spin an object around because if we use the same rotation transform, so the thetas are all the same um, for all of the verts in the object, it will rotate the entire object around zero, zero. So if this thing is not in the center, it's going to like swing the object around zero. So combining transforms. <laughs> Gonna explain this. Devastator here is made up of six transformers. So it's a combining transform. Okay. I probably didn't have to explain that. I think most people, I don't know, I actually don't know. don't know how many people know transformers that well. Important mathematical thing that makes sense mathematically and makes perfect sense in a visual sense as well. So this is um, pairing these things together perfectly. I'm going to talk about this in a visual sense, but I have the maths here anyway. Multiple, multiplying transforms together is something that we're definitely going to do. So we're often going to be combining something like a scale and a rotate or something like that. Like when we put objects in our scene in a game, we might put an object in and go, okay, um, our artist has been working very hard on this object and it's very, very highly detailed. However, we're very far away from it. So it's going to be much smaller. So, I mean, we're not just going to scale things because of distance. That's a perspective based thing. But then sometimes we'll be like, they made a statue in, in exquisite detail. Um, but that sketch statue in our scene is currently 400 meters high. So it's a little bit too big for what we want to use. We want to use say a three meter high version of said statue. Um, so we would use our scale transform to shrink the statue down to fit in our scene in a particular way. Um, not only that the statue is supposed to be on the corner of two particular streets in the town we're making. So what we need to do is we need to move the statue in place. So we'd scale the sketch statue down and then we would translate the statue into the position it needs to be. And maybe it's aimed the wrong way. So we would then rotate the statue so that it's facing the right direction. Um, all of these are individual matrices, but what we can do is multiply matrices by each other and all of their effects will be preserved in a single matrix, which is the combination of all of these other matrices. Um, so we can definitely put lots and lots of matrices together into a single matrix. And this can be the, the final transform that, that puts our, our giant statue at the right size in the right place and aiming the right direction, you know, so we can combine scale, rotate and translate, and we just get one very complicated matrix, but it will be the matrix that this particular, um, object uses to find its place in the world. The thing we do have to remember though, that is that matrix multiplication is not what's called commutative. Commutative is a mathematical property where, for example, multiplication is commutative. It doesn't matter what order we multiply two numbers, we get the same result. The order that we multiply two matrices changes the result. So A multiplied by B, so a, a matrix A multiplied by matrix B is not the same as a matrix B multiplied by matrix A. So this is actually really, really apparent in the order of um, the order of using matrix transforms in things if we think about it in a physical context. So if I think about it as moving things around in the world or altering the vertices in something, um, this, this becomes very apparent. So I have some examples here. Um, this is the simple... Um, the simplest way of, of showing this is I just have two transforms. So I'm not even looking at the maths here, but you can see what's going on. 
if I translate, then I rotate versus I rotate and I translate two very different things happen. So if I translate this thing first and then it ends up here and then I rotate it, I'm going to rotate around zero, zero. It's going to swing the object around zero, zero to another position. Um, but if I rotate it first, it's going to rotate it while it's around zero, zero. So it tips without shifting its position too much. And then we can translate it into this position here. So um, it's, what are we talking about? Oh, we're talking about the direction of, um, uh, of rotation. It's actually usually, I think, uh, standard geometrical rotation, right? Where zero degrees is here. This is 90, 180, 270. So anti-clockwise. I'm trying to look at my mirroring <laughs> on my OBS to see whether I'm actually doing this the right way. That looks like I'm doing clockwise. So it's actually that way, anti-clockwise. I, was, I recall like, um, you know, martial arts instructors and dance instructors and stuff like that, having to mirror what they do so that whenever we're, they're trying to teach people to do something with their left hand, they have to do it with their right hand and vice versa. I actually have the same thing with OBS. So anti-clockwise is that way. <laughs> oh, funny, funny things about cameras and stuff. Okay. So generally rotation would be the other way but i mean like you can choose what you want to do if i wanted to this arrow should probably be going all the way around and back to there rather than it actually rotating in this direction but that doesn't change this example so the example is all about the order that these matrices are applied so if i apply to the vector um a translate first it'll move up and a rotate second it will then rotate that around the zero zero but a rotate and translate works in a different way. Um, some things visually you get away with and other things less so. So for example, if I did a scale and a translate, um, I would probably get a similar result. I probably get the same result depending on which way I was scaling. No, I think scale and translate are gonna work fine. You can think about this visually. If I change the size of an object, then move it, or I move it, then change it. Oh no, no, they're totally not gonna work. <laughs> I just thought about that for a second. No, I totally wouldn't. Scale and translate are also not commutative. So if I scale it first, it just gets bigger. But if I was to move this thing a bit so that zero, zero is no longer in the center and then scale it, um, it would then move off in the direction it's being scaled. Well, some of its verts move off in the direction and others don't. So scale and translate has the same problems. Um, so when we are doing these things, we are going to be using these transforms to position objects in the scene. We're also going to be using these transforms in real time. It's not really real time, um, but in between frames to give the, um, uh, give the illusion of movement. So if we do a small amount of translation, um, 60 times a second, we can have an object that sort of animates its way across the screen. Um, so we're going to be using these things and every time we're using them, we're going to probably be using multiple of them at the same time. So you've just got to remember um, the order in which you code these things to run is going to change things. You can learn this, you know, you don't really need to know the maths of why these things happen like this. You can actually just learn it by trial and error by going in and moving things around and then seeing the way that they work. Because mathematically, um, it's actually the final matrix goes first and then the others go after. If you put all the matrices in a line in the vector at the end and you multiply them, you would apply the final matrix to the vector first and then the, the next one. So it kind of goes in this looking like a reverse order. Um, but as, um, uh, as Simon's saying, there is an order that we often will do things. Um, so, and Michael's got a good question there, how to rotate around a point that's not the origin. Do we translate, then rotate, then translate back? Yes. Um, because the cool thing about this is if we want to, we can prepare matrices in advance. So if I want to rotate around this point here, I can translate the, um, the object to the center, rotate it, and then translate it back. Um, the negative of where it was. This doesn't actually take more processing power if we've prepared the um, the matrix in advance because the amount of processing power the matrix takes is the number of multiplications to go through 
Um, so it's just floating point multiplications, which is not super expensive on the graphics card. Um, but so long as we've composed the matrix by multiplying all of these matrices together into one, and then we perform the calculations with that one, um, it's actually reasonably quick. So a lot of the time we will prepare a lot of the matrices in advance for something. Um, but we can do a lot of them in real time as well. As Simon's saying, order n cubed to do matrix multiplication. I'm assuming the n is the number of cells in the matrix. Is that n cubed? Or it's the number of cells in the vector, the number of dimensions in the coordinate space. Okay. We're going to go into this in more detail. You're going to actually use some of these in the tutorials to position things and move them around and stuff like that. So what I wanted to do... Oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry, I knew I was moving on to the next topic. There's one final slide. So now that we've reviewed all this maths, we are going to delegate most of this work to a library. Um, you are not going to have to write functions that do the multiply, multiplying the rows by the columns and all that kind of stuff. We can assume that that kind of work can be done for us with a library. I still think it's important to know things like this are super important. Um, the ability to actually multiply these by a vector is something that you, you need to know exists, um, but you're not going to be doing manually. So we have a um, maths library, GL maths library, that is going to apply matrices for us. So we're going to be able to build a matrix by saying something along the lines of translate along the vector for one. Um, and we throw that at GLM, the maths library, and it will create the matrix for us. Um, so we're, we're very rarely ever going to be manually editing matrices. I mean, there are times where we might, depending on the situation, um, we don't need to necessarily memorize that to rotate an object around the origin, it's cos, then negative sign, then sign, then cos. I remember, I remember memorizing this stuff because we had an exam on, on stuff, but like, you didn't even have to memorize that, but I memorized it anyway, years and years ago, and it's not entirely necessary to do that especially in 3D, where if you're going to rotate around any of the three axes, um, this thing changes. But we're not going to talk about that yet. Um, so you don't need to like memorize those particular things, but understanding how they work is still reasonably important. Oh, Simon's going to remind me what an identity matrix is. If we, um, if we have a matrix, let me just... Oops. There is one particular matrix which is kind of useful. So if we're in 2D space, it's this. Um, but basically it's a diagonal row of ones. Uh, this is called the identity. And it's useful because no matter what you multiply this by, the thing doesn't change. So the identity matrix, you can multiply it by another matrix, the matrix will remain unchanged. You multiply another a vector by it, that vector will remain unchanged. So with matrices, it's hard to kind of um, have the idea of the number one. So the number one, that way you multiply it by things, nothing changes. Um, so we have this layout, this diagonal row of ones layout. And so if you're working with this, you're gonna end up in a situation where um, Nothing changes if you multiply it by the identity matrix. And this comes in handy every now and then because we need to start from something uh, when we're making other things. So you'll see this pop up every now and then. Um, and I think you can create an identity matrix and then start manipulating it with other things. Um, was there a question? No, it's okay. All right. Going to move on. Trillor has a, has a decent look at that. Yeah. Uh, graphically, the identity matrix is the same as the scale matrix for scaling everything in one to one. So you can actually see how that is not going to change anything if you have a decent understanding of the scale. Or you could say it's a translation matrix where you don't move the object. So if these are zeros, then you're not changing the object in the X, nor are you changing in the Y.
A wave plasma was asking what the advantage of defining all the operations as a matrixy, matrix is because wouldn't all the extra zeros that do nothing just add extra computational cost? I mean, yes. You do a lot of multiplying by ones and stuff or multiplying by zeros that don't necessarily do anything. However, the capability to apply a single matrix to all of the verts in an object and have these predictable results come out of it um, there's no other way to do this in a nice way so if i say i want to move my object a certain distance to the right and i don't know what that distance is until i've calculated per frame what i'm doing this is much easier than any other thing that we could do um, to change all of the points in an object um, especially when you look at like something like rotate or scale or even better I'm going to rotate and scale and translate an object, or as we said, to rotate something back around its own arbitrary point, we're going to translate it, then rotate it, then translate it. Um, if we tried to do that with just like non-matrix maths and stuff, we just have this really, really complicated code doing it. Whereas if we say uh, translate, rotate, then translate, multiply those all together into a single matrix, then apply that single matrix to all the all the points, all the verts, that's way less calculation going on on our graphics card because no matter how complicated our transform is, it's one matrix multiplication onto the verts. So the bit that's important, which is the, um, the amount of work you do per vertex in the scene, matrices reduce that amount of work significantly. They mean you never double handle any vertices. You only ever apply one matrix to the verts and that matrix may be like 18 matrices multiplied together but that work is simple because you do that work once and then you apply it to 10,000 verts um, but only one matrix gets applied to 10,000 verts and you can do really complicated transforms with it so that's a lot of the um uh a lot of the reasons why we use these transforms people are talking about CPUs, GPUs, and the different ways. Yeah, okay. I'm not going to go too deep into that. <laughs> All right, because one thing I wanted to do, we've got about 15 minutes left, is I wanted to do a small case study. So this is not the last time we're going to do one of these. I like to, especially because I know that people have a lot of interest in games, and, and really what we're doing in this course is slowly building up uh, a 3D game engine, in a sense. So I wanted to look at, if we have textures and transforms, is it possible to replicate a two-dimensional game? Um, and I could have used any two-dimensional game, but like I photoshopped, I didn't photoshop, I MS painted <laughs> this one as a joke. So um, I thought it'd be funny um, to look at, but also um, look back at some of the tech. So you've noticed that this week, all the games I've been playing have been arcade games. So sprite-based arcade games. And I thought, okay, why don't I show you a bit about how you could actually build this game using the techniques I've taught you. So this is pretty cool because we've only been in graphics for two weeks, but I think that we have the majority of the capability now to make something like Super Mario Brothers or my artistic license here, Super Mark Brothers. <laughs> okay, so sprites are textures. I showed you a way of using textures, which is to wrap a texture around an object. Um, so the, the kind of idea was that the object exists as a geometric shape, uh, possibly a complex 3D geometric shape. And what we're doing is we're putting a property on it, which is fundamental to it, its surface properties. But you can do cooler stuff than that with textures. So for example, this sprite sheet here. So these, these are um, sprites that have been extracted from the, um, the NES Nintendo Entertainment System version of Mario. So this is very simple. Um, Mario, not many pixels to these. If we put this thing in a texture, these all become texels. But the cool thing that we can do here is if we wanted to, we could take the texture coordinates for a small section of this larger texture and say, I'm going to map my texture coordinates 
to this Mario. And then the next frame, I'm going to map my texture coordinates to this Mario. And then the next frame, I'm going to alter my texture coordinates to this. So depending on what state Mario is in, is he, is he in a moving state? Is he in a jumping state? So there's the jumping state here. And there's this one, which I couldn't figure out. I think it's an in between other things. It might be partly jumping or it looks like the arms are up like that. So it's a dash state or something. It's basically the Mario dab state. <laughs> um, so when I'm moving around, I could change the texture coordinates. So what I, what I could do for this really easily is I just say Mario is a rectangle. I can simplify my vertex information so much that Mario is just a rectangle, like nothing more than a rectangle, four verts, two triangles. But what we do is for the character to change what it's doing, we just map to different coordinates in this one texture. And again, one texture makes it really easy. We don't have to bind the object to a different texture or anything. We just move our texture coordinates around on this texture based on what's happening. And so Mario picks up uh, a mushroom and we move from this layer in a sense of, sorry, I said layer, layer is something different. <laughs> I'm just getting into Photoshop world here. But we move from this area and the texture to this area of the texture. And what we might do when Mario changes state to, the, to being the mushroom, because we see that the texture's a different size, we would probably scale our rectangle larger um, and then start sampling from a different space in the in this texture so it depends sometimes people will do things like this with all of this in one texture sometimes in different textures there are actually sprite based engines that, that we can use for this kind of stuff but if i'm only giving you what i've taught you so far the fact that we can use texture coordinates to sample color data from a big bank of color data like this and I've, we've done verts and polygon rendering, and I've given you some transforms, we can actually still do everything we need to do to get Mario to appear and Mario to change to different sprites. It's super fiddly if you do it this way, because you've got to be like, all right, map these texture coordinates exactly. So we have to figure out what the floating point is of the top left corner of this and the bottom right corner of this. People usually um, use specific software for sprite sheets to do this kind of thing. Um, but you could totally do it. Um, and then we can think about the transforms for Mario. So how do the controls affect the character? So if we're taking directional input, so we've got a, a joystick or we've got a gamepad or something, um, we can take that input and then every frame. So if we're running the 60 frames a second or 144 frames a second, every frame we'd look at what buttons are currently being pressed. So is something being held down or not? So is the left button being held down? If the left button is being held down, then we translate the character somewhere. Um, is the up button being held down? Actually, it's not up, but I think there's a specific jump button for Mario, not, not up. Other games will have up as their jump button, but do we change the sprite when that's happening? So if we're translating the character, do we change the sprite to a running sequence? Um, jump might need special code where we are tracking a kind of a parabolic arc of movement or something like that, and we'd be doing our translations based on that. So at the same time as we're translating objects around based on movement, we'll also be changing the sprites um, based on the, the state of the character. And it's like, oh, hang on, hang on, this is more complicated than this. Do we translate Mario or do we translate the whole world? Because as if you've played Mario, you know that as Mario runs, Mario does not run across the screen. Mario runs a certain distance and then the screen starts sliding behind him, right? So we have the a certain amount that we can see the world ahead of us when we play a game like Mario. So we would have a whole lot of code there to maybe keep track of Mario's relative position to the world, relative position to the screen space, and say, once he reaches a certain point forward in the screen, the screen's going to move and he's not going to. So depends. There's going to be like kind of like a whole lot of calculations on like what's the elasticity of where Mario is versus where the, where the world's going to move. And again, as I said before, change of state might make us scale the rectangle that is Mario um, vertically to match a different sprite. I think it might have been horizontally and vertically. Um, 
And also, this is something that we've already kind of covered. Are we going to scale the verts before or after we translate Mario to, to whatever position Mario is in? So if we were to translate Mario into a position that is nowhere near the origin, and then we scale, what we're going to end up with is the whole of Mario is going to move, or it's going to move vertically and stuff like that. So we do need to actually make sure that our transforms for this are going to, um, uh, are going to work correctly for this kind of thing. So there's a lot of background mass that goes into this. There's a lot of deciding how we want to change something and then trying to figure out how our transforms are going to support us changing this. So as I said, I've given you the tools to make Mario, but whether you could do it quickly <laughs> is another story entirely. Um, we haven't yet talked about the environment. So we've got sprites and textures for the environment. We have repeated textures for the ground. Let's go back and have a look. See, look at this. This is obviously the same texture over and over and over and over again. So how am I rendering the ground? I am using a single texture and this big rectangle but what i'm doing is i'm using my texture coordinates in this rectangle really intelligently so i don't know how many there are there's about 20 of them there so my texture coordinate might start at zero at this end but it might be up to 20 at that end and i've specifically used um gl repeat on this texture so that i get the same texture coming up coming back over and over and over again uh, across this kind of floor space here it looks a little bit silly because it's so obviously repeated, but again, we are looking at a particular era of games here where the the cost um, in memory of just storing textures is is a a massive amount of um, a massive amount of extra work. Should point out, Simon's also saying that like if only GL Repeat existed in 1982. It's important to think that what I am teaching you here is how we could replicate Mario with our modern techniques. Mario was not done like that. So a lot of the way that um, these early games were built is, is nearly like hardware design. It feels like hardware design um, because they were designing chips to go on a car on a, on a cartridge that was going to get plugged into a machine. So a lot of it is actually like um, hard-coded um, ROMs, so read-only memory, that is just going to be like these textures and things and then how they actually relate to each other and then that, that plugs into, like physically plugs into the console that then processes and stuff. So it's a really, really hands-on process. Um, yeah, so we might use repeated textures. Um, the wrapping system that we might use for that is going to be the GL repeat wrapping system. But then also it's like, how are we building this whole background? There's this like massive backdrop that is going to be sliding past. And it might be sliding past at a different speed. So there's, there's, there's options here. One option is the ground is one object and the entire background is just a flat plane that um, has drawings of this stuff. So this is that the, the idea that I was talking about before. Really, really simple geometry, complex texture information. So we could have a texture, which is this entire rectangle here, in a sense, of color data. Well, not these. These are interactable objects, but all the background objects that have no relevance to our scene. Or we can have a situation where... Um, each of these objects is a separate rectangle and those are put on the backdrop where and as they're needed. The cool thing about having, say, the clouds and these mountains and these bushes as separate rectangles is you could move them at different speeds. And so you can get this illusion of parallax, which is the idea that when we walk past something, those things nearer to us will appear to be moving faster than those things further away. It's a classic like Disney animation cell shading would do that. Multiple layers of transparent um, uh, cellulose, cellulite? Cellulose. No, cellulite is like fat. <laughs> cellulose. <laughs> um, and, and by moving the different transparent sheets at different speeds, it would have the appearance of things being in front and behind each other. So these could all be on like, you know, just drawn one after the other on a flat plane, but moving at different speeds. I mean, you can actually see how this little design here is repeated here, here, 
and here. That's a single texture that's getting used multiple times in this. Well, it's not a texture because it's Mario. There's, there's no textures there. They're sprites in this era. Um, yeah, so building the background, we could do this as like a flat color for the entire level, but then we have individual objects or a big sliding texture. The downside of the big sliding texture is people are going to start to recognize the pattern, but you will get away with it because people aren't that focused on the background. So if you, if you're going for, um, performance, the big sliding texture is really cheap. Um, but if you're going for that parallax thing or the variety of the background, those individual objects like the clouds or mountains with their own textures on them, each of those could be its own rectangle and they slide across at a different speed. Um, and that kind of speed of movement, there could be a universal speed of movement, which is the, the speed the ground is going to move. And then each of the things behind it could be like a, um, a lesser amount of translation based on parallax. So it could be like the blue sky background never translates. So that would be at a scale of zero and the clouds always move at half the speed that the ground moves. And so then you'd get your parallax thing. So there's a lot of little tricks that we'd use to, to try to get, um, uh, a game like this to actually, uh, to actually exist. And so you can try some of this stuff, you know, so after this week's tutorial, you will have had a look at, um, doing things like transforms, um, doing things like, um, texturing a really simple object. Um, you can start importing your own images as textures and seeing what you can do with them and stuff. So like, it's, it's technically possible that you could get a certain amount of Mario Brothers way, only a certain amount. I'm not going to claim that you can implement the whole game. We also haven't even done anything with like interaction between objects and stuff. Um, that would come under the topic of collision detection, which is not a graphics thing, but a game design, well, not game design, game programming thing. Okay. So wrapping up what we learned today, we were going into more detail about texturing. So last week I introduced the concept, not last week, Monday I introduced the concept. Um, but today what we do is what we did was take it a bit further. We looked at what happens at different sort of levels of detail of textures and mip mapping, but also wrapping, um, over the edges of objects, getting smooth transitions on, on the same texture and things like that. We also looked at transforms and a little bit of a refresher on linear algebra and how we're going to use those. Um, and we wrap that up with a quick kind of example of if we have a game like this and we only have these tools, like we only have texturing on quads and, um, transforms that is actually enough to do. Uh, a, a complete game like Mario. We didn't talk too much about the update loop and things. So the thing that runs every frame update. Um, but you can see that in, in some of the sample code that we've got and your tutors are going to start showing you stuff like that. So that like, cause OpenGL actually has some helping, some things that will help for like things like the frame update. And also I think there's some stuff that's going to handle like real time user input and stuff as well. So we're not going to have to, um, you know, code that super explicitly ourselves. So I will wrap it up there. I think we've hit 12 PM perfectly. So as opposed to last week where I accidentally, was the last lecture where I accidentally wrote not enough content and started freestyling about textures today, I actually wrote the right amount of content for two hours. It's hit and miss sometimes. Um, so I will go into break mode, wrap up the official lecture there, and I'll hang around afterwards if anyone has any questions.
All right, oh, I'm back. <laughs> People saying game devs hate this man for revealing all their secrets. I have a feeling that game devs don't. Game devs won't hate me for revealing the secrets because um, they would prefer that everyone knew this before going for jobs in game dev and stuff. It's quite funny actually because um, I was talking to people who um, uh, worked at Animal Logic. There's actually like someone in this class actually works there, uh, and they worked at Animal as a um, um, like as as management for one of the teams there, and so they had no idea how graphics worked. They were just like, no, I I work people, not not graphics, and it was really interesting because they've been watching um, some of my lectures and they're going, this is really handy. Like now I know what what my team was actually working on. So that's interesting. <laughs> so um, someone's, oh, was, Robbie was asking, so would you use transparent pixels for the blank spaces in the rectangle of Mario? Yes, I would. So what we would do with this texture here, in fact, I'm pretty sure this texture image, all of the pixels that aren't, um, uh, that aren't colored as Mario are actually transparent. So what we would do is we would have Mario as a um, transparent rectangle where some of the colors are not transparent and the colors that are not transparent are just specifically the colors that are here. Um, the sprite-based system, sprite based systems were always very good at that. Um, when we're looking at rendering stuff in 3D and we're like blending the color of the glass in a window with the colors behind it, things get complicated. Um, but when it's like sort of a stencil cutout, um, you could do that more easily on these like kind of 8-bit computers and stuff. Um, having said that, you could totally do that. If you wanted to do this uh, in the systems that we have, um, yeah, then, then then you would use some transparency. We haven't really gone into the details of that yet, but I'm pretty sure it's not too hard to look up how you would turn on transparency for, for objects. <laughs> what are people saying? Clarissa <laughs> asked your brother to explain the combining transforms transformer. Yes. It's Devastator and it's a combination of six transforms. Wait, well, let me, let me, let me, let me give you a better example of this. I'm just going to hit, take over the whole screen with my camera. So this is, I bought this in Japan years and years ago. This is a slightly bootleg uh, version of Devastator. So you can see here, this is the whole of Devastator. And you can kind of see the vehicles, like there's a crane there, there's a cement mixer there, that one's a bulldozer and stuff. But here on this side, you see the six individual transformers that, um, and each of those transforms between those small construction vehicles. Um, and then here on the back, you can see that we've got the arm is, is, is that earth mover. And we've got the bulldozer here as the other arm. The top half of the torso is the crane. Bottom half is like a big truck. And then there's a, an, a, another kind of earth mover. I don't know what they're all called in a cement mixer there. And so how these all combine together to make the big uh, devastator. This is one of my like prize possession toys because it was just like um a really highly detailed version of devastator that i got from japan oh simon wanted to read it hang on which bit there you go i'll leave it there for a second Type G, giant type G1. Well, it's giant type 61 in English, and the 6 and the G look pretty similar, so... I can understand why, when this is in Japanese and they're just translating it to English. And I mean, it doesn't even have to be the same, because that's not even the name of it. That's their name for avoiding getting sued by Hasbro for copying the design of one of their toys. Alright, put myself back in the corner. 
So yes, that's Devastator. And that's why it appears in the slides, because I love it so much. Um, Giant on the transform. <laughs> it says, it transforms big. That's great. I love it. Um, okay, Rory was asking, could we actually just replicate a level of Super Mario for the first assignment? Yes, you could. Um, that's a lot of work, by the way. That is a stupendous amount of work. Um, you can replicate some parts of it, and and yeah. So that's that's an example of something that could be kind of cool in terms of like going for those um, subjective points, you know. Um, having said that, if if half the class does that, then all of you get less subjective points. <laughs> so so see what you want to do. Like Mario as an example that's used in the lectures, yeah, that's cool. But I reckon there's going to be other things you can think of. Um, Mario was obviously not the only game <laughs> in that genre or to use that type of animation. Uh, Wave Plasma says, games these days, those days use color keys rather than alpha, right? Since that would be extra competition, which they couldn't afford. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily, um, actually don't know. <laughs> I always teach this as like how you could do this with modern day tools. And I don't really know that much about how they made them, but I'm pretty sure there isn't like an explicit transparency layer. It's more that this sprites, they, they wouldn't be in one sheet either. They would be like toggling between these things. Um, and I think it's that they would color things and then this thing would color things um, and it would replace colors but it would it just wouldn't replace colors where it didn't have any information but i don't know for certain so your guess is as good as mine wave plasma um any other questions anyone has actually it would be really interesting i wonder if i'm sure there's going to be like documentaries out there and stuff about how mario was made however for those of us who are computer scientists, majority of this class, I assume, um, you know, they probably will never go into the detail of, of how it's made at a level to satisfy us. They'll probably be talking about its impact on, on the world, its impact on sales of the Nintendo Entertainment System and all that kind of stuff, which is still really, really fun. Um, there's a documentary series called The Games That Made Us, and they go through a lot of wait is it called the games that made us i know there's the toys that that made us and the films that made us but there's a games one which is really similar but i can't remember what the name is um and they go through several of the famous games um and uh and how they ended up being and it, it's really good because it's it's quite personal so that they, they talk about the people who made them and what they were thinking and stuff like that don't don't necessarily go through okay here is the programming technique that made this thing um but still i think a lot of fun to watch um looks like they we don't necessarily have any questions at the moment um so I might wrap up there. It's always like, I've realized now that um, both of the lectures in this course are like mealtime lectures where like at the end of every lecture, I, I'm always like super hungry. So it's like <laughs> the Monday night is always like, I want to have dinner at the end of the lecture. And then the Wednesday morning is always like, I want to have lunch afterwards. <laughs> but you know, as we get more technical, I think more people are going to hang around at the end and ask questions and stuff like that. So I'm happy to stick around for a bit. But it looks like today um, was just a bit of discussion about how we do stuff in games. Um... <laughs> Simon's also saying, wait till you find out how John Carmack made a completely new system to scroll left, right, up and down on non-specialized PC hardware. Um, John Carmack is one of those people who... It's worth just at least looking up a little bit of uh, what Carmack has done. Because he... Basi I don't want to say he invented the technique because he didn't. A lot of people invented the technique over time in different ways. But he was the first person to take polygon rendering and make it run on a computer. I think that's true. I hope my claim is true here. Definitely his work on Quake is what started the polygon rendering revolution in, um, in 3D graphics. Or one could say started 3D graphics in a sense. Um, and got us to the point where we are today. And he hasn't stopped working because he is now working with Oculus 
so he's he's working on sort of the the next level of technology is working on um stereoscopic 3d and stuff like that so um it's pretty cool uh right and simon's saying the nest had specialized hardware to do side scrolling which makes so much sense when you think about how little computational power that console has and how many of its games just do side scrolling like it's like yeah okay might as well have something specialized for it okay i'm gonna wrap it up there thank you all for coming along um we will we will see you on on discord over the next few days and then i will see you again on monday i am going to try to organize um friday i think friday afternoon sessions on discord so that we can um answer people question people's questions and help people out with technical things a lot of um the the chat on ed and discord has been trying to get your configuration set up for assignment one we've been working pretty hard in the background to try to tune that setup so that it works the best that it can so we've got teething issues for assignment one but assignments two and three should go really smoothly because of this so hopefully everything's gonna everything's gonna pan out and everyone will be able to get their assignment one up and running we're gonna give you as much help as we can for that all right see you all soon and thank you for coming along